Okay, uh, in the previous lecture we talked about regularization. Uh, we are not done with regularization. In fact, there are a couple of important techniques that we need to cover. One of them is dropout. And dropout is a recipe of basically any uh, structure of neural network that you may work with these days. Usually, you apply dropout to some layers. <clears throat> OK, what is dropout? Uh, dropout is uh, originally introduced in 2014. Uh, as I told you, it's very popular technique. This paper by itself has close to 50,000 citations. Uh, the idea, the key idea of dropout is to randomly drop some nodes. So basically, if you have a, a network like this, a dense network, you are going to randomly drop some of these nodes, and your network becomes sparse. Okay, and uh, so let's call this thin uh, network instead of this dense network or a sparse network. So in each iteration, I'm going to randomly drop some of the nodes. So I don't have the dense network anymore. I have a sparse network. And I'm going to learn weights that exist, not those weights that have been dropped due to dropping the nodes. So only a subset of uh, uh, weights exist now. And through back propagation, I'm going to just update those weights. And I'm not going to touch the rest because they do not exist in this network. <clears throat> in the next iteration, this network has changed because, again, I'm going to randomly drop some other nodes. You know, I'm going to start in the next iteration. I'm going to start with this one and randomly drop some other nodes. So I have another sparse network, which is different from this one. But I'm going to do exactly what I was supposed to do for any network, you know, doing uh, uh, back propagation and learn a, a subset of nodes that exist in that sparse network and don't touch uh, those weights that uh, have been dropped. So we continue this until it converges. In the test case, uh, we come back to this dense network. But we multiply each weight by the proportion of time that this weight presented during the training. Uh, it will become more clear in a minute. So if you want to see how does this work mathematically, uh, suppose that we have capital L hidden layers in a neural network. Uh, and suppose that ZL is the vector input into layer L, okay? And YL is the output of layer L. So Z is the input, Y is the output of layer L. <coughs> uh, and W and B are biases and weights. So we are going to define a Bernoulli random variable R. And then I, we are going to multiply this Bernoulli vector of random variables pairwise to y. So this notation means pairwise. So the size of r is the same size of y, the output of the layer. And when you pairwise multiply this Bernoulli, Bernoulli is either 1 or 0. So uh, for, for, for those positions that's 1, it passes. For those positions that's 0, uh, it's dropped, you know, you drop those nodes. And then everything else would be the same, you know, uh, forward pass will be applied to Y tilde, and Y tilde is the sparse version of Y. It's not the original Y, you know, it's it's a sparse version after you, uh, you uh, pairwise multiply this by a Bernoulli uh, variable and, and drop some of the nodes. So you do forward and then you do uh, and, and then after this, you, you apply this uh, activation function f, and then you do back propagation. And uh, you choose a parameter, p, as the uh, parameter of this Bernoulli. 
And that's going to be uh, basically one of the hyperparameters of your model. <coughs> so uh, training, I explained how the training works. In the test case, as I explained, you know, uh, you're going to come back to the dense network that you had at the beginning. Through the training, you had many sparse network, and you updated the weights of many sparse network. In the test case, you come back to the dense network, and uh, a, sub a subset of no subset of weights have been learned uh, in in each iteration, and eventually the model converges. <coughs> so you have a set of weights, but you multiply these weights by p, the parameters of your Bernoulli, because this will show the proportion of time that this direction, this weight. Uh, presented during the training, you know? If, for example, my, my uh, P is 0 0.5, so I sample from a Bernoulli with 0 0.5, means half of the time this W presented, this node presented during the training, presented in one of those sparse network that I used in, in some iterations. And if it is 0 0.2, means only 20% of the time that was presented. So we uh, multiply this by this P, and <clears throat> we, we're going to use basically this dense network with PW instead of W, and Ws have been learned through uh, dropping some of the nodes. So this is called uh, this is called uh, dropout, which is pretty common. So. Uh, <coughs> What's the justification for dropout? So we can justify dropout in uh, different ways. One way to think about dropout is to um, think dropout as uh, some sort of an ensemble method. You know, uh, in, in the previous lecture we talked about uh, bagging, and bagging was basically. Uh, ensemble of some different uh, experts or uh, model. You know, you are doing classification, for example, and instead of one classifier, you have many classifiers. And then you take a majority vote, for example, of these classifiers, or you take average of uh, the opinion of these experts at the end. <coughs> uh, it's not practical for neural network. You know, neural network takes forever to train. You know, it takes for a long time for training. You cannot afford training many, many networks and then uh, basically take uh, average or majority vote of them. But um, one way of thinking of dropout is to think that each of these sparse uh, models that we had true training is one expert. And at the end, when we multiply this W by P, it's as if we are looking at the average of them as expectation of them. So as if we have many experts and we are taking the average vote or average opinion of these experts. So that's one intuitive way of thinking about uh, dropout. There are some uh, mathematical justification, not particularly for neural network, but for linear model, you basically can show that if you apply dropout to a linear model, it's as if you applied a version of ridge regression. You remember what was ridge regression? Ridge regression, you have uh, you know, this uh, y minus xw, the list of square problem, and uh, <coughs> in ridge regression, Basically, uh, you add the uh, L2 norm of W to your optimization problem. You shrink the weights. So uh, it's a, sh a shrinkage method. So it's, uh, you can think of this similarly, but I'm not going to go through the details of this proof, but here is a sketch of, of, of the proof. You know, if you have y minus xw and square, 
and uh, x is your data matrix, it's n by d, and y is your response variable, it is uh, n by 1, and w is vector of your weights, which is d by 1. Then this is a list of square problem. You can compute W and uh, fit your X to your response variable Y. And in the regression, we are going to add uh, L2 norm of W to this. <clears throat> okay, so uh, suppose that I'm going to do apply dropout to this Y. Okay, and I have uh, a, a random variable R, which is Bernoulli, with parameter P, and instead of Y minus XW, I'm going to do Y minus uh, R, uh, pairwise product with X and W squared. And so if it's a vector, let me write capital R, same size of X is my Bernoulli matrix. <coughs> Uh, so we want to see what's the effect of this dropout. Uh, let me call this matrix M. And so we are dropping uh, some elements of X this way. Uh, basically, if you do this many times, what would be the effect? Basically, what would be the expectation of this? Uh, so if I expand this, and I multiply, I, I, I uh, replace R X by M. If I uh, expand this, this is going to be Y minus M W transpose times Y minus M W. And then it's going to be Y transpose Y minus uh, 2 W transpose M transpose Y. You know, we have W transpose M transpose Y, and we have another term, uh, which is basically uh, Y transpose M W transpose, but this is a scalar, so I can put a, a two in front of that. You know, this Y is N by one, and this is uh, M was uh, R times X, which is n by d, so m transpose would be d by n, and this is 1 by d. You can see that it's a scalar, 1 by d, d by n, n by 1. So it's a scalar, so I can put 2 here. So it's going to be minus 2 w transpose m transpose y, and then I have another term, which is w transpose uh, m transpose m w, okay? So this is expect, uh, uh, you know, uh, expansion of this. So if I'm interested in expectation of this, so I have to look at the expectation of this with respect to R. Um, so what would be expectation of Y transpose Y with respect to R? It's just Y transpose Y. It has nothing to do with the random variable. And the only random part is this M here. So it's going to be minus 2 W transpose expectation of M transpose Y plus W transpose expectation of M transpose M W, right? And uh, so M is a matrix, expectation of a matrix is basically uh, expectation of cells of, or expectation of the matrix, a random matrix, is, is a matrix of expectation of cells of that matrix, right? So M here is R times X, so basically expectation of M is expectation of uh, R X so it's basically is going to be X times expectation of R right <clears throat> X is not random it's expectation of R 
and R is Bernoulli with parameter P, or, uh, you know, let me write it this way. So I'm interested in expectation of M. I mean, to be more clear, let me talk about expectation Mij, just one element of this matrix. That's going to be Rij, Xij. So it's going to be Xij. And expectation of one cell of Rij would be just P, right? Because P is the parameter of the Bernoulli. So this is basically P times Xij. And if I look at expectation of uh, <coughs> M transpose M, Ij element, so I can basically write M transpose M Ij as a summation, you know, I have two matrices, M uh, transpose and M, clearly the one is the transpose of the other, and we are multiplying these two together, what's that? It's, it's just summation of, I can write it as M, like Ki times Mkj over all Ks, okay? And uh, <clears throat> this is going to be like summation of R Ki times Xki and R Kj times Xkj. And it's going to be uh, you know, if I look at the expectation, you know, if I look at this expectation, then expectation of uh, M transpose M I J is going to be like uh, summation of x k k i times x k j and then I have these two r k i which is one element of my Bernoulli matrix and r k j so basically I'm interested in expectation of RKI times RKJ. And these are Bernoulli, right? So what is the expectation of RKI times RKJ? I have two Bernoulli elements multiplied to each other. So if, uh, if uh, I is not equal to J, so if they're independent random variable, each with parameter p, two Bernoulli random variable, each with parameter p, expectation of a times b. Both of them are Bernoulli independent. So it's going to be like uh, p squared, because they are independent. But if <coughs> i is equal to j, if i is equal to j, so it's going to be e r k i squared, but it's Bernoulli. Right, and Bernoulli is either zero or one, so it's a squared Bernoulli. It's expectation of a squared if a is Bernoulli is expectation of a because a squared would be a, right? It's either zero or one, so it's p. So if i is not j, it's p squared, and if i is j, it's p. Now uh, <coughs> we have the uh, expansion of this expectation, let's write uh, expansion of this quantity, y minus <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> 1 minus px w, when p is over parameters. So if I expand this, this is different from uh, this expansion, you know, <clears throat> instead of multiplying uh, 
matrix R to X, I'm just multiplying this scalar P, which is the parameter of Bernoulli. They want to know what the uh, expansion is going to be. It's going to be like Y minus P X W transpose times Y minus P X W, which is Y transpose Y minus 2 P um, W transpose X transpose plus W transpose X transpose X P uh, X uh, W transpose X transpose X W times P is squared right <coughs> yes okay <coughs> Uh, so compare this, compare this quantity with this quantity. This quantity here, actually, we find out that it's going to be uh, p times x. So it's 2 w transpose. So basically, it's going to be a minus 2 p. W transpose X transpose Y. You know, and I have this term here, minus 2 P W transpose X transpose, right? Um, and I forgot Y here. So I have that term. And I have the first term. So if I compare this one with that one, I have the first term. I have the second term. The third term uh, we realize that in some cases it's going to be P squared X tra W transpose X transpose X W. In some cases it's going to be P. But here I always have P squared. So I can rewrite uh, that expectation in terms of this quantity. And if I want to rewrite basically expectation of uh, y minus r x w with the similarity of these two I can say that this is basically you know because I have this term in common this term in common and I'm not sure about the third term so I can write it as y minus p x w squared which is this three terms minus the last term which I'm not sure about yet plus the last term of that one which is <coughs> W transpose uh, expectation of M transpose M W right and then this basically this can be written as W transpose um, P squared X transpose X plus expectation of M transpose M. Actually, there is a negative sign here. W. And then you can, then, and we have seen that this is in some cases P squared, and in some cases it is P. So for the cases that's P squared, for the case that I is not equal to J, so it's going to cancel this. It's going to be zero. And for the cases that's P, we have uh, negative P squared X transpose X plus P X transpose X. So basically, you can write it as sort of P uh, times 1 minus P of the diagonal of X transpose X. And then you simplify this. You can see that basically uh, the expectation of Y minus X W when dropout has been applied to X is this term plus some uh, additional term and this additional term is a, a regularizer which affects sort of uh, similar to uh, ridge regression. Okay, so shrink the weights. 
So this is basically justification for dropout or, uh, I mean, it, it, it gives us some sort of insight to the uh, dropout technique for a simple linear model, which has the effect of shrinking uh, the weights, similar to ridge regression. So we can assume that something similar happens in uh, a neural network. <coughs> okay. So that was about uh, dropout. And when another very important method that we have to cover is batch normalization. <clears throat> and similar to dropout, which is recipe of any, almost any neural network that you work with, batch normalization is also part of the recipe, you know. You can see that um, there's the layers of batch normalization after each layer, or many layers, in, in any neural network. <coughs> this uh, paper is, uh, the original paper also is quite popular paper, uh, cited again, uh, I mean similar to dropout, cited about like 50,000 times so far. Uh, okay, what is batch normalization? I'm going to explain batch normalization the same way that it has been explained in the original paper 2015. That's based on some intuition, and I'm going to explain those intuition. Uh, <clears throat> it turned out that uh, those intuition and insights that was the base of batch normalization in the original paper in 2015 are not correct in fact. You know, we have a paper in 2019 which shows that those intuitions are not correct. And we will go through them. We will go through the 2019 paper afterward. But let's start with the original uh, intuition, <coughs> which led to uh, batch normalization. <coughs> when I say it's incorrect, it, it doesn't mean that the technique is incorrect. It's still, we use batch normalization the same way that it was introduced in 2015. Uh, justification has changed. Okay. So uh, it is. I mean, the, the original intuition is based on the concept of. Uh, internal covariate shift. And what, what, what is covariate shift? Um, covariate shift itself has nothing to do with neural network, you know. It's a classical problem in uh, machine learning. And it happens when the uh, distribution of your training set is different from the distribution of your test set. So basically, you're training a model with a training set. At the test time, the distribution of test set is different from this one. OK, how does this possible? Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, you have a collection of data, and your data is uh, basically want to make a model to uh, diagnose breast cancer. And you have a data set, and you train a classifier or model on this training set. Your training set include uh, ladies after age or close to the age 40 or uh, later. And the reason is that at some age, people get concerned about cancer and they go and see physician and do the test. And so the, uh, your training set is mainly from those people who had this concern and they uh, did the test. Okay, but, but your test set, you want to try your model for any person, not just for those who are older than 40 years. You want to apply it to diagnose cancer for someone at age 25. So the distribution of your data is not exactly the same as distribution of your data in the training set. 
This is called covariate shift. So there's a shift between uh, training and test, and you need some sort of uh, domain adaptation to uh, map the distribution of uh, test set to the training set, make them similar. Otherwise, your model is not going to work. So you have to fix the distribution of your uh, test set. <coughs> okay. So the intuition of this paper was that there, there are some sort of internal covariate shift in the network. So it's pretty um, unclear term. We know what covariate shift is, but it's not quite clear what internal covariate shift means. <clears throat> Their intuition was that, you know, suppose that you have a network with many layers. You have a network with many layers, and no matter how many layers do you have, you can always assume that <clears throat> the output of these layers are the input of this one, and the output of this one is going to be the input of the rest. So basically, I can assume that at this layer, I have a single layer neural network. But the, the, the input of this is going to be the output of so many layers that I have before that, right? So what's going to happen <coughs> in each iteration, I'm going to do backpropagation. And through backpropagation, I'm going to adjust the weight, right? Not adjusting the weight of this layer, adjusting the weight of everyone, including adjusting the weight of this part, right? But if I adjust the weight of this part, I'm going to change the input to this layer. So as if in each iteration, I have a different input. You know, it's moving input. In each iteration, I will change the input. And so the network cannot learn, you know, because this iteration, I, I have one input. Next iteration, because I have updated the weights of this part, I'm going to provide this layer with a different uh, input, right? So it's not going to learn. <coughs> and as if we are changing the distribution of the input uh, over training. So this is what they call it uh, uh, internal covariate shift. So covariate shift was shift between training and test. Now it's as if there are some sort of shift between the input in different uh, iterations. And they want to fix it. So this is from their paper, this image. And um, you know, assume that your um, activation function is a sigmoid function. And your sigmoid function has a saturated part here and a saturated part here and the linear part here. So if the input has a value which basically activates the saturated part of your activation function, the output, because it's, you know, it's going to be applied to your input, the output is going to be dramatically different from your input. The same as this saturated part. But if you're here in the uh, linear part, if you're close to zero, if you're close to zero, the activation function has more linear behavior compared to the case that your input is far apart from zero, either positive or negative, and activate the, the, the saturated part of your activation function. So you want you want your input to be around here and activate the activation function in its linear region. So uh, it's true that in each iteration, my input is going to change. But if the activation function is sort of linear, then I have less um, uh, variation. Okay, that, That's the basic uh, idea. And that's the reason uh, that uh, 
when we want to initialize neural network, we usually use, uh, you know, carefully initialize them close to zero. Because at the, at the beginning, we don't want radical changes. We want the whole network uh, basically behave more linearly. <coughs> And that's the reason that more recent, I mean, in modern neural network and stuff, sigma eight, for example, we use uh, mainly rectifiers, right? And if you don't know what the rectifiers are, rectifiers are a sort of uh, activation function with this four. So it's basically max of zero and x. If it's x, it's positive. <coughs> if x is positive, then max of zero and x would be x, this part. And if it's a negative, it's going to be this part, okay? So basically, um, it passes all positive values and it uh, drops or it uh, <coughs> knocks down any negative value. So it's not linear, it's completely nonlinear. So it can be used as an activation function. And uh, we will talk about vanishing gradient, exploding gradient later on, which is a problem in neural network. So it, it helps with vanishing gradient because the gradient is either one or zero. And so the, the, the problem of vanishing gradient is that if <coughs> the gradient is slightly less than one, or if it's less, let, let me put it this way. If the gradient is less than one and uh, you have a recursive function in uh, back propagation, so you're multiplying, you know, it's a composition function and you're multiplying the gradient of this layer to, to this function, this layer to another, to another, to another. And if it's less than one, it's gonna vanish over time on the limit. And if it's more than one, it's going to explode over time. This will help with that, you know. Uh, it's, it's either one or zero. So it's not in, on paper. It's not going to vanish or it's not going to explode. So we people use rectifiers. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so what's uh, the idea? I mean, the solution to covariate shift is domain adaptation. So, and domain adaptation means make the distribution of uh, your training, the, your test set similar to the distribution of your training set. <clears throat> we can't afford to do this uh, for each layer and each iteration because there are several techniques, many techniques for domain adaptation, but they are expensive. Uh, the idea here is to normalize uh, data at each layer. And by normalizing means that subtract the mean and divide by variance. You are in scenario of batch learning. So you are passing a batch of data, you know, the size of batch is B for example. So this has a mean, it has a variance. So normalize it uh, after each layer. After each layer, basically, you take the mean of these B data points out, divided by the variance, OK? <coughs> That's the idea. So uh, I, I compute the uh, mean of batch and they compute the variance of batches, and then I normalize my data after each layer with, uh, by subtracting the mean and dividing by the variance. So my data is uh, <coughs> basically standard. If it's, it's normal, for example, it's gonna be a standard normal. The mean is going to be zero, the variance is going to be one now. And this epsilon is just for uh, numerical uh, stability. Okay, so I wanted to map the distribution of this and this, and I was not able to do uh, covariate 
I mean, domain adaptation uh, in, in, in proper way, what I did was to normalize this, okay? So I normalized this, the mean is zero, and assume both of them are Gaussian, for example. The mean is zero, the standard deviation is one, but that's not the mean and the standard deviation of the other one, you know, the other set. So what I'm going to do is to add a beta, which is gonna be new mean, and multiply by gamma, which is gonna be new standard deviation, right? <clears throat> so make the data normal, normal in a sense that the zero, one, mean, zero, uh, standard deviation one, then def introduce a new mean and variance to the data by adding, by adding the data by beta and multiplying this by gamma. But what is the appropriate beta and gamma? I don't know. I'm going to learn that. So I am defining two new variables, two new parameters to the model for each uh, layer, which is beta and gamma. And I'm going to learn beta and gamma through backpropagation, uh, the same way that I do backpropagation for weights. So I take derivative with respect to them and update them. So th th this is the idea that, okay, if the, uh, if suppose that these outputs are normal, but there is a shift of distribution, internal shift, and the mean and covariance will not match uh, the other, uh, I mean the data of the other uh, layer, what I'm going to do is I'm going to adopt this by introducing new mean and new variance. And I'm going to learn this new mean and new variance. That's, that's basically the idea. <clears throat> so that's for training. At the test case, uh, in a stuff, the mean of batch and the standard deviation of the batch, I'm going to replace this with, with the uh, population, or the whole data. The mean of the whole population, the variance of the whole population. You know. Okay, this is called basically batch normalization. Why it's so popular? Because you know uh, the the original paper is not mathematical; it's completely intuitive. But um, they showed that basically it, it 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 helps with many things. You know, uh, you know they showed that w with batch norm. You can learn much, much, much faster than without batch norm. You know, if, if this is the uh, steps of iterations, and this is the accuracy, you can see when you have batch norm, you know, pretty quickly you get to 0 0.94, but you know, it takes so many iterations for the network v without batch norm to get to this accuracy. Also, you can use a uh, larger la learning rate when you are batch doing batch normalization. So it converts faster and it helps you to use larger uh, learning rate, which is beneficial for speed up. And in fact, um, in the original paper they showed in, for some network, for some l large network, they had a speed of 30 times, you know, the huge, right? And th it became so popular and people start using this. And as I told you, it's a recipe of all neural network now and it's built in <coughs> in all packages, PyTorch and Keras and, and so on. Uh, so that was, I mean, the technique itself is quite easy to apply, as I said. Uh, the intuition behind that is understandable, but in a, in a vague way, because it's not quite clear what do we mean by internal covariate shift, you know. There's a paper in 2019, uh, the original paper was 2015. <coughs> And there's a paper in 2019, which basically uh, 
shows that our intuition in 2015 uh, possibly is incorrect, or not possibly, certainly maybe is incorrect. In, in, in uh, you know, this is learning rate 0 0.1 with, uh, with and without batch norm. The, the blue is with batch norm. The red one is without batch norm. And you can see that when learning rate is quite a small, both of them converges. The one with batch norm converges faster. If you increase the learning rate, which if you can afford applying <coughs> larger uh, learning rate, the uh, convergence would be much faster. <coughs> but if you uh, increase the learning rate, then uh, the, the model, the standard model, which doesn't have batch norm, will not converge. But the one with batch norm converges. Okay. So it's consistent with all experiment that we had, the original paper and elsewhere. But this paper, this 2019 paper, has four important claims. The first claim is that batch norm does not fix covariate shift. So the main intuition was that there is internal covariate shift, and with batch norm, let's fix it. Let's adopt the distribution and fix the covariate shift. The main claim of this paper is that batch norm does not fix covariate shift. Okay. Second. Okay, batch norm does not fix covariate shift. Let's, let's fix covariate shift in a different way. <clears throat> if you fix covariate shift, it doesn't help. The third one, uh, if I intentionally increase internal covariate shift, it doesn't harm. So pretty interesting, you know, it, it breaks all of our intuition. Batch norm doesn't fix covariate shift. If you fix covariate shift, it doesn't help. If you increase covariate shift, it doesn't harm. And eventually, the last uh, part of the paper shows that uh, batch norm is not the only uh, reason, uh, I mean, the only way to, to normalize network, and you can do it in other ways as well. Uh, the, the paper is quite mathematical, the, has many mathematical proofs. I don't go through those mathematical proofs, but I just show the experiments and the intuition behind it. <clears throat> there are a set of experiments which shows uh, <coughs> that uh, batch norm doesn't help with covariate shift. You know, these are um, a network with batch normalization. The standard plus batch norm. <clears throat> and these are the output of each layer in different iterations. Okay, so each slice is one iteration. So over different iterations, you can see that the distribution of the output is quite stable, has the same mean and same covariance. So batch norm here does. I mean, if we just look at this, we suppose that batch norm does what it's supposed to do. We wanted to avoid covariate shift. We wanted the output in different iterations have the same distribution. It doesn't change the mean. It doesn't change the covariance. And th apparently, that's the case. You know, layer 11, layer, layer 3 of a large network, the distribution over different iterations, uh, when each slice is one iteration, is quite uh, stable. But let's look at the uh, standard network, same network, when we didn't apply batch norm. It's not as good as batch norm, but it's not a disaster, you know. It's, it's, it's pretty stable. So pretty stable in the sense that it, it doesn't, I mean, the distribution doesn't shift dramatically in terms of the mean and variance. And if we look at this more carefully, and look at the difference between mean in different iterations and different between the variance in different iterations. 
when uh, this is standard and the blue is uh, batch norm, for blue you can see that it's almost zero. So we manage to fix the mean quite well. And here we manage to fix the variance quite well. So yes, batch norm did what it's supposed to do. But in the case of a standard, when we didn't have batch norm, which is this uh, line, it's not a disaster. You know, the variance does not change dramatically. The mean does not change dramatically. And suppose that I intentionally add some noise <coughs> and make the mean different and make the variance different, which is going to be this one and these, these lines, standard plus noise. If I do this, it seems that <coughs> nothing, you know, uh, dramatically bad is going to happen. In fact, it might be even better. You know, this blue is a standard plus batch norm, and this is just a standard. And this one is a standard plus noise batch norm. So intentionally, in this case, I increase the covariate. It's better than a standard. Not as good as batch norm, but it's better than a standard. So these experiments tell me that, first of all, before applying batch norm, the, the, I mean, the, the distribution of different iterations was not dramatically different. It was not dramatically unstable. <clears throat> it was quite stable. And second, if I uh, basically intentionally change this distribution by adding some noise to it, it doesn't apparently it doesn't harm the uh, learning also in some cases helps. So it breaks our intuition completely. <coughs> so <coughs> we were in a position that we started with an intuition, we came up with an algorithm, the algorithm works perfectly. Now we realize that the, our intuition is not correct, but the model works. So we need a new justification. Why does this work if the original intuition was not correct? So there are two important points in this paper uh, and two important claims that has been shown both uh, experimentally and mathematically. <clears throat> and the first one is that uh, it is about Lipschitzness of the uh, basically uh, objective function. This is the definition of L Lipschitz, you know, fx minus fx2 is less than equal L times x1 minus x2. Uh, this is called L Lipschitz. You know, if uh, <coughs> if you write it in as uh, well, maybe it's easier if I write it here. You know, uh, if I write it as fraction, basically this tells me fx1 minus fx2 <coughs> divided by x1 minus x2, right? It's less than equal L, and L is... Uh, L is a constant, you know. Uh, 
f x1 minus f no, no, something wrong with it anyway um, <clears throat> so in, in the limit this is derivative right so uh, if I perturb x how the function will <clears throat> change so basically L Lipschitz tell me that um, t give me some bounds of the uh, uh, derivative and this derivative is bounded by L for example <coughs> so the claim is that okay so uh, <coughs> there is a uh, bound on gradient and uh, the, the claim basically the claim of this paper is batch norm improve the Lipschitzness of the loss function improve the Lipschitzness means uh, this uh, f of x1 minus f of x2 divided by x1 minus x2 this becomes a small you know means the gradient after applying batch norm the gradient is, is bounded with L which is smaller than the case that we haven't uh, applied batch norm <coughs> uh, okay uh, in gradient descent, we use uh, basically um, uh, use this gradient, you know, for and, and you can assume that if the uh, gradient is smaller, you know, you don't have huge jumps in your loss function, and you can assume that it's going to help. It also helps with something else. Uh, it helps with a smoothness and uh, a smoothness is basically you know I had the definition of this I don't have the definition of a smoothness but basically uh, we can the, the concept of beta smoothness the same way that we have the concept of L Lipschitz nets the same definition is defined on the uh, gradient of F so basically we're talking about the second gradient so Lipschitz uh, ness basically is bounding the gradient and the smoothness is bounding the second gradient okay uh, <clears throat> yeah I, I had it here <clears throat> let me show you this you know we have t these two quantities <clears throat> uh, we have this quantity here you know suppose that I'm doing optimization and I have X and uh, I'm doing gradient descent and the derivative of my loss is this you know this is the value of uh, basically the cost at point L here and I take the derivative and uh, <coughs> with some learning rate and with some this some learning rate I move the point to some other point so this new point would be x plus learning rate times the gradient of the loss right that's my new point so um, what do you expect if I look at the cost at this new point and my new point you know I had the cost at point X and I moved the point here now I'm looking at the cost at this new point what do you expect if the great if the optimization works correctly the uh, expectation is that the loss at this new point is less than the loss at the original point you know so I'm going in in the right direction I'm going in the right direction so have this in mind that if uh, I compare this quantity 
if I compare this quantity with this quantity and if it's decreasing means I'm in the right direction okay uh, let's look at this one <coughs> I'm comparing the gradient of L at point X I'm comparing the gradient of point uh, this point at at point X and the gradient after uh, uh, we, we moved right if this quantity is a small it means that the gradient is valid after moving means the gradient at point X and the pre gradient and point X plus XT and gradient at, at, at point XT plus one are not that different means the gradient that I computed is valid for uh, this period of time and if it's large means that there has been a huge change between the gradient at point X at and point X uh, you know at point XT and point XT plus one if this quantity is large means there was a huge difference between gradient means the gradient is not valid after one two three iterations uh, and uh, if it's a small means it's a still valid so what do we desire we desire that it's a being a small because if it is a small uh, means I can use larger learning rate uh, because the gradient didn't change that much after iteration so I can use a larger learning rate means gradient is going to be valid for a longer time so this is uh, an experiment that they conducted you know as usual uh, the blue is a standard from and batch norm and this this one and this is the standard one and if you compare these two you can see that uh, this quantity that we talked about is increasing it's decreasing it means uh, we are in the right direction and the cost will get less and less and less after we are moving towards the uh, direction of the gradient of loss but if you call uh, if you compare the standard batch and the standard uh, both of them are decreasing but in a standard you have so many fluctuations okay you have so many fluctuations and you don't have those fluctuations in the blue case okay the same here uh, not actually not the same I mean here actually you can see that the blue is quite small close to zero it means that the gradient is valid for a longer time however it's not uh, the case for the uh, standard one when we didn't apply batch norm so it fluctuates a lot so what does it tell us it tell, I mean the, the first one is a measure of ellipses <clears throat> uh, and the second one is a, a, a measure of indication of a smoothness so our function is more smooth after batch normalization means that I can uh, you know it's, it's more smooth after batch normalization means that I can uh, use the, uh, the gradient in other iterations it means that I can use larger learning rate the gradient is valid for a longer time and it's it's uh, ellipses means that uh, I don't have like bad jumps strong jumps okay so the basically batch norm is batch norm based on 2015 or 2019 paper the same method intuition is different in 2015 said that it's covariate shift 2019 paper says that it has nothing to do with covariate shift we're just changing the variable and instead of working with x we are working with x minus mu times 
sigma plus beta times gamma. And this reparameterization of the network uh, make it mm, more Lipschitz and more smooth. Okay? That's basically the idea. The, the last claim is that uh, it, that's not the only way actually to do it. And a more general way to do, you know, this is batch norm. And the more general way is to uh, normalize with uh, norm P of Y. And, uh, you know, Okay, I don't have the formula. Uh, you can normalize it with norm P. So instead of this uh, division by sigma, you can divide it by norm of Y. And norm of Y could be any P norm. And, uh, you know, norm P, if P is 0, uh, I mean, or, or 1, 1 would be absolute value. and. Uh, zero would be cardinality and infinity would be the max and second norm is l2 norm that we use a lot so any norm will work here actually you know we can use it with any type of norm here and there are papers that have been published and they're in the literature uh, following up uh, the paper that uh, the 2015 papers like the original batch norm and uh, with this finding of this paper that is the more general way of normalizing is normalizing with norm P. Uh, these papers are basically 2016-2018 uh, papers are a specific case of uh, and some other papers are a specific case of uh, batch normalization so we have alternatives uh, for, for batch norm uh, which are similar in, in terms of quality are not better uh, they're similar okay thank you very much that was the lecture and see you on thursday <laughs>